Welcome to MEM 18002, Use Power Tools and Handheld Operations. Welcome to Pertech Learn and Developments. This lecture has been prepared as a supplement to your student workbook and is designed to help you complete the online assessment and practical assessment. Your student workbook is a valuable resource to this unit. Make sure you put some time aside to have a read through it. Make sure you check out the other resources made available to you by Pertech Online also. The internet's another great place to further your research on a topic. Places like YouTube, so one example. What will we be investigating in this lecture? Firstly, we'll be looking at handheld tools, or power, handheld power tools, things like uh, pistol drills and angle grinders. Uh, sanders and nibblers. Then we'll be looking at handheld operations. For example, sharpening a chisel on a fixed bench grinder. Here's an example of a uh, portable power tool. This is a portable electric uh, drill. Here is an example of a bench mounted linishing machine. The machine is fixed and the workpiece is introduced into the sander. Before we begin our lecture, let's have a look at the history of commercially and mass produced portable power tools. The first commercially mass produced uh, powered portable drill was in 1910 by Black & Decker, a US company. We're all familiar with that uh, brand name. There were portable power tools available from the mid 1800s, but these were usually custom built difficult to use, extremely dangerous and expensive. Today there's a vast variety of energy sources available for power tools, which include mains power, battery power, pneumatic, and even explosive. Imagine having to drill thousands of holes or screw hundreds of screws by hand every day. Before the advent of electric motors, Dozens of machines were powered by one single steam engine, all connected by a shaft and flat belts. This would have been disastrous if the steam engine ran out of coal or broke down. Pneumatic tools still work on the same principle, where dozens of air power tools are powered by one central compressor. Compressed air is still a preferred energy source when high speed and electrical safety are required. Learning a new thing or skill can be frustrating or daunting, especially if regular training and upskilling is part of your workplace obligations. Having a good plan and understanding of what learning is will help us make the most out of the situation and the opportunity. Before we start, we need to identify what we're doing. What we're doing is we're learning or becoming competent at something. How do I get good or competent at something? We use a competence formula. Don't panic, don't panic. We're not doing calculus or mathematics. It's just a cool uh, way of visualizing competence that I spotted on uh, the internet. I thought I'd like to use it because it uh, represents the, the three things, which are knowledge, perseverance, and talent. These are the three things that we need to be good at or competent at something. It's an interesting formula. If we have a look at it, it tells us that competence is 70% knowledge, 20% perseverance, and only 10% talent. Competency is mostly, in this case, 70% knowledge. This is interesting. Perseverance, 20%. What does that mean? How quickly does a person give up? How much time do they throw at developing a skill? For example, does a person that's not so good at brazing keep practicing or just give up and realize that uh, they don't have what it takes and uh, get somebody else to do it? This is a case where knowledge is more important than perseverance. Could be using the wrong gas, could be using the wrong consumables, could be using the wrong technique. So again, points back to knowledge rather than perseverance. 
This is interesting. Have a look. Talent makes up 10%. What does that mean? What it means is just because you're a good soccer player doesn't automatically mean that you'll be good at playing cricket. Look, you can wing it, think on your feet, but that's not going to get you out of trouble forever. There's nothing more than knowledge. And the perseverance to get that knowledge is the key to competence. Again, knowledge and the perseverance to get that knowledge is the key to get to be competent or be good at something. Now, talent will only get you so far and then you'll hit a brick wall. We've heard this before, knowledge is power. Reference books and materials are an important source of, you guessed it, knowledge. References are important. Good, good reference materials or knowledge are vital to get the job done. Especially for engineering trade people, technical references are vital for our day-to-day -day activities. We can't be expected to memorize thousands of threads and part numbers. So reference materials are critical and how to get our hands on those reference materials is important. Being organized is the key. Knowing where your information is, is easier than remembering everything. Organize your information as you organize your tools in your workshop. The Machinery's Handbook is a great example of a reference. The Hydraulics Handbook. A Pertech Parts Catalog is another. Now we're going to have a look at the steps and equipment required to manufacture this hydraulic manifold bracket. Here's the engineering drawing from our client. We'll need to check through to make sure there's no information missing. If there is anything missing, we take note of the author and uh, clear up any uh, ambiguities in the specification. Here we have the title block from the engineering drawing. It's got the uh, contact details of the author, part numbers, general information about the uh, component that we're going to manufacture. This is the, uh, the area of the drawing that contains all the global or specific information uh, related to the uh, component. Looks like the author hasn't specified the grade of aluminium that I'll be using. And they haven't uh, specified a surface finish either. So I'm going to have to uh, contact the uh, author of the uh, drawing and, and check these up. In the meantime, I'll look up what the recommended uh, material and surface finishes for this type of component from the, you guessed it, machinery handbook. Now I'm going to need a plan. Winging it or thinking on my feet is not guarantee of quality. I can't rely on my talent. I need to plan, be specific, because any mistakes or unforeseen issues are going to delay the job or even cause the job to be faulty or unsuitable or not fit for purpose as they say i've identified the job specifications now we need to select and check the material again i'm going to have to uh, confirm with the client as they didn't specify the material type in the uh, drawing i'm going to have to decide what power tools and what equipment i'm going to be using and in what order of course and documentation and ppe are important also at this stage. Always check your stock. It could have been incorrectly labelled, it could have been incorrectly packaged, it could have been placed in the wrong section in the raw materials rack. We need to identify the grade of material also. That might be sometimes a little bit more difficult. Sometimes we're going to have to sort of uh, be a detective and uh, look up the brand or any serial numbers on the material or check with the person who originally purchase the material. As I'm compiling my list of tools and equipment, is there anything I need to purchase? Are there any tools missing? Is this going to delay the job? Can I use an alternate method? 
this particular job. I've decided on my mains powered drill, a bench top linisher. I'm going to need clamps. I'm going to need a drill set. I'm going to need a countersink set. I'm going to need a tapping set for creating the threads. And I'm going to need marking out equipment. Okay, before we go any further, it's uh, time to take five. Do I need a risk assessment? Is there a safe work method statement for this activity? What are the hazards? What PPE do I need? Do I need permission or permits to use this equipment or tools? I've checked the material. Now it's time to work out the order of operations. What that means is what order should things be done in? Obviously, I'm going to have to drill a hole before I tap it. And obviously, I'm going to have to cut the rectangular piece out of the stock before I uh, drill the holes, etc. My marking out tools might consist of scribers, a steel rule or a tape measure in this case. We've got half a mil tolerance according to the uh, uh, mechanical drawing, so I'm pretty confident that I can measure within half a millimeter with a tape measure. Engineer square, marking blue or sharpie pens. Just remember that uh, scribers can damage the surface finish of the component. This is why uh, marking glue or Sharpie pens are used uh, when marking out. Remember, we add the Sharpie pen and then we lightly scratch lines onto the Sharpie pen because uh, obviously the, uh, the Sharpie pen line thickness could be two or three millimeters. Center popping is a common method of marking hole positions. This keeps the drill bit in position and uh, prevents it from skidding around the surface of the workpiece uh, during the uh, drilling operation. In this operation, we will be using a mains powered portable jigsaw to cut the rectangular section out of the sheet. I have fitted a metal cutting blade to the jigsaw I've looked up the data sheet and I've set the reciprocating speed for aluminium. Hold on a minute before we begin. Has the handheld jigsaw been tested? Is the testing and tagging up to date? Is it in good condition? Is there any visible damage to the jigsaw or to the lead? How do I check this? Safety is your problem, safety is everybody's problem. If there is a fault with the portable power tool, you'll need to tag, isolate, and report. Use an appropriate isolation tag on the power tool and place in an appropriate isolation area. If you perform the risk assessment, you've probably identified the PPE that you have to use. Collect the appropriate PPE and make sure it's in good condition. Scratched and dirty safety glasses create their own problems, so make sure that your safety equipment is in good condition. Never hold anything that you're cutting with a power tool by hand. Always clamp the workpiece down or secure it in a work holding device, like a bench vise. In this example, I have clamped the sheet to a sacrificial piece of timber clear from the bench. This keeps the job secure and my hands clear from any moving parts of the power tool. After I've cut the uh, rectangular section from the main sheet using the portable jigsaw, I'm going to have to remove the burrs. Here I'm using a bench mounted linishing machine to remove the burrs and create a small chamfer around the plate. Have you noticed that I'm not wearing gloves? Gloves can get caught in moving parts, causing serious crush injuries or abrasive injuries. This would have been identified in your risk assessment. If you prefer to use a file, filing is another way that we can remove burrs. Again, don't forget to clamp your workpiece down. Do not file or deburr the workpiece with a file while holding it in your hand. Now we're going to use a portable pistol drill 
to drill the holes. Don't forget, when you're loading or clamping a drill bit into a drill chuck, the cordless power drill should be disconnected from the mains. Hang on a minute. Before you loaded the drill, did you check to make sure that the test and tagging was up to date on the pistol drill? Is the pistol drill in good condition? Is there any damage to the pistol drill or the lead? Have you worked out what PPE you're going to use? Now that I checked that the pistol drill is in good working order and the testing and tagging is up to date, I can continue now and load the drill bit into the drill chuck. Once again, always load and secure the drill bit with the power tool isolated from the power source. That means unplugged. In relation to drilling speeds, just the rule of thumb uh, method is the bigger the diameter of the drill, the slower it should go because our speed setting uh, uh, options on a drill is pretty limited. To be more accurate, we can use formulas or lookup charts to work out the correct RPM for the drill bit. Again, the, the RPM is relative to the material that we're drilling and the cutting tool alloy. In this example, we can look at our lookup chart and a five millimeter drill bit made out of high speed steel cutting alloy will have to do 4,875 revolutions per minute. So obviously I would uh, set my speed on my portable pistol drill as close as I could to that speed. Once again, the workpiece is clamped with a sacrificial piece of timber underneath to protect the drill and the bench. Again, my hands are well clear from the moving part, in this case, which is the drill bit. Here, we are utilizing a bench vise to hold the workpiece. This particular example is not ideal, as the hardened steel jaws of the vise could damage the soft aluminium workpiece. In these cases, soft jaws are recommended in these situations. It can be a simply a piece of uh, bent copper or aluminium sheet to protect the workpiece from the uh, jaws of the vise. Any machining operation creates burrs like drilling, sawing, and we require a lead in chamfer for the tapping operation, especially for the holes. So a deburring tool or larger drill bits can be used for this operation. Keep in mind, if your drawing specifies a 45 degree chamfer, your drill bit point angle might not be 45 degrees or produce a 45 degree angle. The drawing hasn't specified a chamfer size. So it looks like I'm gonna to have to recheck with the designer. And in the meantime, I'll look up a generic uh, value from the machinery's handbook, which I can recommend to the client. According to the drawing, the four center holes require tapping. The tapping size is M6 by one. This means a six millimeter outside diameter thread with a one millimeter pitch. The metric system specifies threads by their major diameter and pitch. The pitch is basically the distance between the peaks of a thread or how far a nut would travel along the bolt during a 360 degree rotation. Calculating the drill size in a metric system is very easy. All we do is subtract the pitch from the major diameter. In this case, the major diameter is six millimeters minus the pitch, which is one millimeter. So the drill size would be five millimeters. So those four holes in the middle of the plate would have been drilled at five millimeters. Drill tap charts or your machinery's handbook will also contain drill size information. Sometimes we don't have a metric drill that we can use. We can maybe look at an imperial or an inch drill that uh, is close. In this case, we could use a 732 inch uh, imperial drill bit to drill that uh, tapping size. Always secure the workpiece when tapping. This will ensure a straight and accurate thread. We're not finished yet. 
double check the part against the drawing dimensions. Always remember the golden rule. If in doubt, ask. Don't guess anything. Reference everything and check with your client if you're not sure about some details of the job. Finishing up. Always clean up after yourself. You can always spot a competent engineer on how they work and keep their work area. Clean and inspect and stow your tools and equipment carefully. This makes sure you're ready for the next job. And finally, don't forget TIR. Tag, isolate, report any damaged or faulty tooling or equipment or power tools. Working safely and effectively is everybody's responsibility.